It's taken one of the worst um, stretches uh, for the economy in American history to get people to finally pay attention to him. Um, he has been ahead on the uh, economy. He has attempted to audit the Fed now nine times. They operate in complete darkness. We had somebody on Rick Santorum on last week, and I asked him, shut down the Fed. And he said, well, I might. Not. Really? Shut them down. They have no idea what they're doing. Um, it kind of makes you uh, look at things and, and, and wondering why we're into regulation about absolutely everything except the Fed. Not that I want to regulate the Fed. I want to get rid of them. But that's a different story. Um, he understands this probably better than anyone else. He is now in Des Moines, Iowa, Republican presidential candidate, Texas Congressman Ron Paul. Congressman, how are you, sir? Doing well. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I, I've said that this today is going to end in one of four ways, and the one way that it could end uh, is with renewed prosperity, but it would go through austerity, we would have to make the cuts, we would have to keep taxes low, and then we would have to deregulate all of the citizenry, the exact opposite of what everybody in Congress has been doing and the President has been doing. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would add one thing, though. In order to get to that point where you start doing the right things, you have to get rid of the mistakes, which is called getting rid of the malinvestment and the debt. A, an economy doesn't grow when it's overly burdened by debt and the mistakes made previously due to the business cycle. So you have to liquidate that. Then you go to this of having sound money, limited taxes, limited regulations, and we could get back to growth again. The problem is, is nobody wants to allow the correction to come, and we're prolonging the agony. We're piling on the economy, and that's why we're three to four years into it already, and uh, there's no signs of strong recovery. So uh, until we do that, you can expect the economy to get much worse. Um, do you see any, any sense in Washington of people cutting the debt? I mean, I know Jim DeMint has come out and said, mm -hmm. cut it. Um, he wants, uh, not, you know, don't put the debt, you know, don't raise the debt ceiling. I know you're against raising the debt ceiling. Um, don't right. raise the debt ceiling. Um, let's, you know, let's get serious about debt. With an exception of a few people, do you think anybody's going to do that in Washington? No, they'll, they'll raise the debt limit, uh, whether it's temporary or long term, but I don't think they're going to uh, go past August and not raise the debt limit. So I think that's going to happen, which will just encourage the spending again. So, but they, they can't come together on how they want to cut spending because uh, one group thinks that uh, you can't ca possibly cut a penny from overseas spending. The other one says you can't cut a penny out of entitlement system. And I just happen to believe you should be able to cut both. And I don't think for a minute it would hurt our national defense. I think, uh, you know, our defense is not strong because we're spread too thin around the world. But uh, to get that agreement is going to be very, very difficult. Uh, and for that reason, I predict that we're going to continue downhill. The deficit is going to be the burden that we can't handle and that we will eventually have a currency destruction because we do rely on the Federal Reserve. As long as the Federal Reserve, I call a facilitator. They claim it's the Congress. They spend too much money and they're forced to do these things. But if the Fed couldn't create money out of thin air to buy Treasury bills, Congress would be forced to do something because interest rates would rise and that would be very, very harmful. So it would be on the, on the Congress's uh, uh, shoulders to do something. But instead, we keep spending and uh, the um, Federal Reserve accommodates and they say, well, we can't let interest rates go up. So they just print like crazy. It's pretty amazing that it's worked this uh, as well as it has. For for so long, but it doesn't mean it's going to last forever, and I think that's why people are so upset in this country, because right. more and more people are starting to realize uh, that this is coming to an end, and it's probably not in the too distant future. May I ask you one question I haven't been able to figure out? Um, I think the Ford Foundation and the, um, the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller uh, Foundation have done more damage to this country than I think, I think a lot of people um, combined. The money that they had at the time that they just poured into uh, all of these things came from uh, a system of no income tax where the rich were getting richer. Vanderbilt was the same way. They did a lot of great things and there were people like Carnegie who was absolutely fantastic. Without a virtuous and moral people, which our founders said we had to be or the system wouldn't work, without a virtuous right. and moral people and no regulation. Is there any way to stop um, 
uh, capitalism from just being god awful ugly? Well, I don't like to think of capitalism as being ugly, but I think what you're talking about is the consequence we have. Here, uh, and wait, 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 wait. Here's what exactly what I mean, and maybe you can answer it directly. What I mean is what de Tocqueville talked about, that there would be people that would become so rich that they would kick the doors closed for others. Soros is doing it now. He's kicking the door closed for other people. Um, when they get, when these people like Rockefeller got so wealthy, that's what they did. Can you... Is there well, any regulation on that? Well, I think some did and some did not. Now, Carnegie gave a lot of his money back, and I don't think of Bill Gates as a monster, and I don't think of, I don't either. Uh, of uh, Warren Buffett as a monster. So it has to do with the morality. Yes, that's the part I agree with you, the morality of these people. But even if there were no income taxes and they got very, very wealthy, if they didn't cheat, if they didn't get benefits from the government, being very, very wealthy, there's nothing wrong with that. But I agree if they get you. very, very wealthy because they get contracts from the government or they get loans, low loans from the Federal Reserve and the banks get bailed out and they do all the gambling and they're the ones who get the bailouts and the little people lose their homes and their jobs, then it's a rotten system. But I don't call that capitalism. I call that cron uh, cronyism or, uh, or, or f f lending itself toward fascism. So that to me is a lot different than free market right. capitalism. I like to use the word free markets because capitalism people get a little bit confused on that and think it is some people have painted it as a very bad term so I want free capitalism markets. I don't is want the government only. giving any favors under those conditions the consumer becomes the dominant force they determine everything what the prices should be what the wages should be and what the product should be and who survives and who doesn't not the government okay real quick because I've only got 30 seconds where do you stand on Israel sir well, I stand with Israel like I stand with all countries. I think we should be friends with all countries. I think that we should always aim to have everybody uh, as our best friend, like we have Canada. We trade with them. We travel back and forth. We don't give them money. We don't promise them anything. And we do quite well. So I think that if you teach countries to be dependent on us, that they become uh, dependent economically or even militarily, it does them harm. Because okay. what's uh, why I worry about Israel right now because of what's happened in the Middle East and us going bankrupt. The first and most important reason to have food reserves is to be prepared in case of an emergency. There are an average of 392 large-scale natural disasters a year. Add to this the possibilities of unemployment, accidents, and downturns in the economy that have 43 million Americans on food stamps, and food reserves make all kinds of sense. But food reserves are not just about you, are they? They're about you and all the people you care about. Let me illustrate my point. The price of food is continually rising. What if you found out about a grocery store that opened up in your neighborhood with prices from 10, 15, even 20 years ago? Would you shop there? <laughs> Probably. What if the food was free? Would you keep it to yourself? Or would you feel inspired, even responsible, to share that gift? eFoods Global can help you and your family and friends prepare for an uncertain future with our food reserves. And we can even show you how to do it for free. The more of us that are prepared, the more generous and empowered we will all be, and the safer our families will be. Now let's continue our tour by showing you what goes into making eFoods Global reserves and why they are the right choice for you.